guess we are still waiting for other people to join us. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, our colleague Angela will be able to, um, you know, message and and uh, it'd be great to know where you are joining us from. And joining us from Ken, it is very sunny, uh, so I'm hoping that it will be the it will continue to be that till the till two p.m. Um, firstly, quick intro about us. Uh, we're Charity Digital. Uh, we are a registered UK charity. Our mission is to help you know other non-profits and uk-based charities to increase their impact by being more digital and we do that through two main activities uh, the first one is providing access to the software products charity needs at heavily discounted prices and the second is publishing content, whether that's videos, uh, webinars, podcasts, articles um, that educate charity professionals and volunteers on how to make the best use of digital. Um, so very welcome uh, to you, whether you're joining us for the first time or you've been a regular webinar attendee. Today's session is on digital inclusion in the charity sector and my colleague Ewan Mark Jones, our head of content uh, and myself a little bit, will also explore the fundamentals of digital exclusion and inclusion, uh, explore the findings from the report in detail um, that we recently published and look at the ways charities um, can bridge the digital divide looking um, into the future. Um, now, just before we start, there's a few house rules. Um, the first one being the session is being recorded and we will upload it to watch on demand within a week's time. The slides, the resources, the reporting itself will be made available to you all by the end of the day. So don't worry if you missed anything. Closed captions are available and you can enable these at the bottom of the Zoom window normally. Click the up arrow button next to closed captions and show subtitle. Um, during the webinar, please ask loads of questions in the Q&A section and we will um, spend about 10 minutes answering them towards the end of, uh, of the hour. And then if you have any other comments, tips or experience, that's in the chat section. If there's a particular question in the Q&A section that you would like answered, uh, you can also upvote the question. And then if you have any uh, sound or image issue, please do let us know in the chat section and we'll do our very best to um, get back to normal as soon as we can. Um, without further ado, let me hand over to Johan. Hi, welcome. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for the introduction. Well, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm going to crack straight on. So to start, we're looking at the background to our digital inclusion campaign. Um, so every year at Charity Digital, we focus our attention on an area that we think would make the most impact. So it aims at tackling the most important issues that are currently confronting the charity sector. So in 23, we launched a climate action campaign complete with the Knowledge and Insight Hub, short and long form articles and webinars and uh, podcasts. You can see an array of them here. Uh, we published a report, which you can see on the left, or a snippet of a report on the left, and a video, which I won't play for you, but that's an insight that looked at tech and the climate crisis. Our goal is always to dig deep, to explore what's happening across the sector. We want to uncover key routes to success and identify areas of improvement. So in the simplest terms, we aim to help the sector progress. Um, so this year, uh, in 2024, we decided to focus on digital inclusion. Uh, so why did we do that? It's an issue that aims that aligns with our mission to support the use of digital in the charity sector, but it's also an issue that we feel was somewhat ignored or at least underappreciated. So as ever, we set about doing what we do best, which is conducting research and creating content to help charities become more digitally inclusive. So in the first few months, for example, uh, we took some decisive action. We collated a detailed digital inclusion resource bank, which you can see on the left. Uh, we wrote about what it feels like and, uh, and interviewed some people about what it feels like to be digital, digitally included, excluded, sorry, in 2024. And we wrote a really long form how to guide to help charities tackle digital inclusion, some of which is included in, today, in today's webinar. We explored the concept of the purple pound and we improved our own website accessibility as much as we could. We sort of investigated what we could do and figured the easiest ways of, of improving our own thing and hoping that in improving our own website, accessibility, we could pass that knowledge on to other people. 
we were learning the entire time and with every article we wrote, every piece we commissioned, every session of training we attended and every conversation we've had with charities dedicated to digital exclu exclusion, we've learned loads. So uh, this is about to start what we'd learned. So the fundamentals of digital inclusion. Let's start with some definitions. Uh, digital exclusion is when individuals or communities can't fully benefit from digital. Exclusion stems from a wide range of factors, including connectivity issues, lack of online accessibility, and the lack of skills. Digital inclusion is when digital technology, services, and opportunities are fully accessed, used, led, and designed, importantly designed, in equal, meaningful, and safe ways. The above, in the simplest terms, defines the two concepts our campaign sought to tackle. So let's explore digital ex exclusion to start. What are the main causes? So the online and offline worlds currently don't operate in ways that are inclusive to everyone. Websites and digital devices are not always built with, uh, for people with disabilities in mind, and digital tools can prove expensive for people to effectively access essential services. Many people do not possess the skills, the knowledge, or the confidence to effectively use digital tools. Geographical factors, such as li people living in landlocked, remote, or disaster-prone areas, can lead to digital exclusion. And related to the geographical, many people are excluded sheerly by the absence of effective infrastructure, which it tends to enable digital usage. So who precisely faces digital exclusion? Well, it impacts people across the world. Uh, so according to the International Communications Union, for example, 2.9 billion people are excluded digitally worldwide. According to a recent Deloitte report, one in seven people in the UK currently face digital exclusion. The Great British Geography of Internet Use Engagement maps out online behaviour and shows that lower internet use exists among rural communities. And it also notes that lower trends of, of usage are based on the age of the area and the socio-economic characteristics of people living in that area. So that means older people do face higher levels of digital exclusion. Uh, we, we tend to see that a lot. But digital exclusion impacts people of all ages, not just older people, as is sometimes presumed. It's sometimes almost framed within that in, in that prison sort of thing. Uh, people from any socioeconomic background can face digital exclusion. But again, the exclusion does tend to hit people from lower income areas and households. And economic shifts does impact digital exclusion. So one obvious example, a recent example, is the cost of living in crisis. So in 2023, the UK Communications and Digital Committee reported that an estimated 1 million people have cut back or cancelled internet packages in the last year due to affordability issues. A report from the Lloyd Bank found that cost of living crisis impacted 35% of people in the UK, that's around 18.7 million people, in their ability to go online. So it's a widespread issue and can hit a lot of people, and that's, that's what our research uh, has told us, especially when it's often considered to hit people, um, only older people, people from um, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, so digital inclusion is the act of countering digital exclusion uh, in the simplest terms. We can separate inclusion into four key categories, availability, affordability, accessibility and participation. So let's start with availability. Uh, uh, availability, digital inclusion means ensuring physical objects and infrastructure are available to all. That might mean smartphones, computers, fiber optic cables, routers, uh, satellites and so on. That also means appropriate speed and quality of the internet, always allowing people to use digital services effectively, whether they're studying, working, accessing vital services and so on. And the ability, the absence of availability excludes, preventing people from meaningful digital engagement. And availability is quite closely linked to affordability. Consider, for example, that while 95% of people around the world could theoretically access a 3G or 4G mobile broadband network, billions of them are currently unable to have that access. That's at least partly because many cannot afford access. Digital inclusion means ensuring cost is no longer an obstacle. And cost means every element of digital, ranging from cost of hardware, software, tools, platforms, online services, internet, data, and so on. Affordability is a social issue, one that concerns us all. An exclusion based on unaffordability is an issue of inequality. Consider, for example, that many people with disabilities typically earn less and face additional cost challenges, such as the financial impact of assistive technology. Lack of affordability stems from inequality, but also heightens inequality. The Digital Poverty Alliance, as you can see on the slide, say it much better than I could. 
So being cut off from digital isn't just an inconvenience, it compounds and exacerbates poverty. That's no longer something we can ignore if we're interested in a just society. Brilliant there from the DPA. Uh, next is accessibility. So access means ensuring digital is designed for everyone. Designed is a key word here, designed for everyone, regardless of gender, age, ability, or other characteristics or location. As per the social model of disability, it is not an impairment that disables people with disabilities, but the barriers that are created by society. Barriers exist in both the physical and the digital realms. Barriers are created by the design of digital tools and the internet failing to meet access needs, reflecting social biases towards people with disabilities. The UN Roundtable on Digital Inclusion, for example, found that digital accessibility could be implemented by legislators, legislators, policymakers, IT providers, platform creators, and other stakeholders. The key term here is can. At present, many of those people are simply not doing enough. For charities, access means ensuring service users with disabilities can access those services. A report by Scope, for example, uh, found that people with disabilities are more than 50% more likely to face barriers to accessing online and digital service. That's something we need to change and quickly. As Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web states, the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect of that. So moving on to the final piece is participation. So digital inclusion means the freedom to participate. A significant barrier to access is where the digital environment is hostile, unsafe, or otherwise unsuitable to people to, for people to participate. The internet is a space where exploitation and exclusion occur posing significant barriers, especially for marginalized, minoritized, or vulnerable people. Common online tactics include gender-based violence, harassment, cyber-stalking, cyber-bullying, misinformation, disinformation, phishing, hate speech, censorship, surveillance, data exploitation, and so on. There's a lot to cover there and probably outside the realm of this webinar, but we look at loads of those in our, in our campaign. And many great charities work to end abuse, but we'll, we'll just mention one, which is Glitch, who offer training, research and community building. Their free resources include guides to being an online active bystander, documenting online abuse and dealing with digital threats to democracy and more. So to summarize, digital inclusion involves availability, affordability, accessibility and participation, ensuring that people from around the world are capable of a meaningful engagement online. But what about the charity sector? How is the charity sector tackling digital exclusion? How is the charity sector aiming to promote digital inclusion? That's why we created our report. That's why we engaged in it in the first place. And our report, Digital Inclusion in the Charity Sector, we'll turn to now. I'll hand over to Lisa. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Johan. And yes, so we'll, we'll delve a little bit more into the findings of the digital inclusion um, in a UK charity sector report. Um, we launched it as part of the obviously our campaign this year, uh, because we wanted above all else to better understand the sector and explore the digital exclusion challenges that um, charities are facing. Um, so we broke the report into three sections. Um, the first section is digital services. <clears throat> So, um, you know, we're going to share a few numbers here. So don't worry if, um, you know, it can be a bit uh, perhaps overwhelming. Everything is going to be on the slides and will be shared with you anyway. Um, but very importantly, uh, our survey found that this year, 90% uh, of charities are now using digital tools uh, that can be laptops or using Zoom and smartphones to deliver their services. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great start because it's, shows that the sector has grown in skills and digital capacity. Um, compared to 2020, there were only 60% of charities who were delivering services online. Um, and more than a quarter of charities were actually forced to cancel services because of the lack of digital skills and technology. Um, so, Obviously, the fact that so many services are now being delivered using digital is excluding service users who aren't online. 
Um, and then, so the survey found that in 2024, charities are indeed facing challenges when it comes to reaching service users. Um, over half of the respondents said they find it hard to reach service users because of the tech problems. Um, and two thirds said they can't implement tech uh, because of lack of skills among the service users. So why are charities experiencing tech problems? And obviously the most obvious is the cost. Um, it's hardly surprising that cost is the biggest barrier to deliver or improve digital services. It was, um, you know, cited as nearly seven in 10 um, respondents. Um, secondly, is the lack of skills among service users and then followed by the lack of skills internally. So either the volunteers or the staff. Um, so it means that charity professionals as well as their service users are held back to varying degrees by the level of tech skill. So we'll explore that in the next section. And essentially, some of our respondents said, you know, we're a small charities, having services online is most cost and time efficient for us, but we are aware we can't reach any, you know, everyone. Um, and we know some of our potential service users are struggling to access digital services due to lack of hardware, lack of skills, lack of data. We're going to see that in a minute. Um, and then a third respondent said that our limited resources are focused on immediate service delivery. So prioritizing digital engagement is not an option, unfortunately. Um, it's difficult to divert resources when it might negatively impact service delivery in the short term. So, and and you know, we we we've seen some some comments from some of you, and it's it definitely resonated with um, with quite a lot of our respondents. Um, next, the second we looked at was digital skills. And a big part of digital inclusion is about learning the skills needed to access the online world. Uh, you can have the greatest tools in the world, but if your service users, your volunteers, your staff don't have the skills to use them, they remain inaccessible. Um, so the good news is, is that uh, most charity professionals feel confident using tech at work. Uh, so 72% said, you know, they rate themselves between eight and 10. Um, it's also worth noting that 84% of the trustees that responded to our survey rated themselves as seven out of 10 in confidence levels, uh, which is great because, um, you know, the role of trustees in, in driving digital within charities is very important. And we, you know, we we observed the whole spectrum of digital skills amongst the, the service users, the volunteers and the charity professionals. And when we ask the charity professionals about the tech they find hard to access, um, some respondents, uh, you know, answered some, you know, specific skills like using CRM, analyzing data or web design. Um, some others noted some uh, difficulties with uh, things like using printers and photocopiers or Google Drive. Then moving on to, um, you know, again, still digital skills, 70% um, of our respondents, which were charity professionals, um, they said they do not offer any digital skills training to service users. It's completely understandable. Um, you know, many charities that are focusing on getting help to where it's needed and training on tech might not be seen as an effective use of resources. Um, we also had a high number of responses telling us about, you know, funding pressures, uh, which could be impacting the ability uh, to provide digital skills training. And we'll talk about them a little bit later, but we just wanted to mention the National Digital Inclusion Network. It's a very useful resource for charities of any size in the UK who can either join the network to gain access to free skills training for service users and grant opportunities, or they can signpost users to a local skills hub. And that's being put by the Good Things Foundation, and we'll we'll give a bit more details about that later. And uh, and again, you know, many of our respondents said that the biggest challenge, perhaps, when you work with a lot of volunteers, is that there's such a variety of home lives, you know, different access to internet, to devices, skills level. However. 
from a charity perspective, you need all of your volunteers to meet similar standards and access of the services. So how, how do you get to that? Um, another respondent said that, uh, you know, digital is just too difficult for some older people to understand and use. Sometimes they are afraid of doing something irreparably wrong. So again, how can we help them um, as a sector? How can we help more of our service users to um, to try and not be afraid to, to use technology? Um, and then uh, another respondent said that uh, from their contact with community members, uh, lack of familiarity with tablets and smartphones is holding back inclusion and so you know the the you know the next slide is all around the you know the access the accessibility because if people have the skills to get online are they actually able to access the internet do they have the right devices? Do they have access to data and broadband? Um, you know, and do the websites they visit uh, cater to their needs in terms of accessibility? You know, in terms of contrast, for instance, or different types of languages uh, being available. Access is a vital pillar of digital inclusion and one that is all too often ignored. Um, you know, access is prevented by various means, Obviously, lack of skills is a primary issue cited by close to 50% of our respondents. Um, lack of confidence, you know, follows closely, cited by 46%. And then costs appear again, cited by 37%, suggesting that funding for digital inclusion remains, you know, a priority, but it's still, you know, it's still being hindered by, by the lack of funding. And then, um, obviously, moving on to the the fact that uh, you know there's other um, hindrance to digital access. It's obviously you know lacking suitable devices. You know the right you know lacking platform internet connection that also are posing challenges to charities. Um, so there was also some issues with online servers, lack of mobile coverage. And, um, you know, CRM was also uh, cited as an issue in order to access digital really easily. And essentially, um, when it comes to accessibility, um, close to a third of our respondents say they are unable to make the most of their tech because it is not accessible to people with disabilities. And this is a huge problem. Um, you know, online accessibility is important for every sector. And in some cases, it is a legal requirement. Uh, but charities in particular need to meet the needs of their communities. Um, so that three in 10 respondents said they are unable to make the most of their tech and provide, you know, the tech to their service users and, and, and uh, via the service services because it is inaccessible should be a significant cause for concern. And, uh, you know, obviously some of our respondents said that, you know, there's no point in promoting digital inclusion if the devices um, and the Wi-Fi access cost are prohibitive uh, to the beneficiary we support. Um, so uh, this organization said that when they run online services, they make sure they provide devices and data packs to beneficiaries um, and they include this cost in the grant proposal for funders. Um, and then um, on the other hand, some uh, other respondents said that they were, weren't able to access some software because of the cost. And they also have trouble with finding good enough laptops for the staff uh, team due to high cost. Um, and by the way, Chai Digital could, could perhaps help with that. And we also have a, a, a good network of, um, of all the organizations that can help with that access to tech and to digital. And, uh, you know, in terms of tackling digital exclusion, you know, the report still provided really, really promising findings. You know, some charities are making a lot of efforts to tackle digital exclusion. Um, 45% of our respondents said that they provide their service users with digital tools like hardware, software, and 44% said they have not, so it's quite split. Um, but, you know, clearly we can show, there's an, we can see there's an appetite to tackle it. Um, so awareness and appetite are clear throughout the report. Um, 
you know, 82% of the trustees that were surveyed through, you know, um, through the report um, and all the C, you know, CEOs and CFOs that we that we surveyed um, said that they were concerned about digital inclusion in their charities. So it's really a, a large number of charity staff and senior members of staff that are really concerned about whether their charity is is being inclusive and and they're wondering what you know what they could do and and perhaps what what's missing is is the more concrete step and and this is where we are we are getting to in into our fourth part um because loads of respondents provided really helpful suggestions explaining some of the best ways that charities can promote inclusion. Um, so we found three main ways to promote digital inclusion. We'd love to hear more uh, from you guys in a chat section. Uh, and the first way uh, to promote digital inclusion is, is to train employees and service users. Um, training was the most regularly uh, cited you know, way to, to improve that. Um, free training would help boost digital inclusion, especially if the training could effectively meet service uh, user needs. Um, as we've seen earlier, because less than half of the charities are delivering digital skills training to their staff, their volunteers and the service users, um, the appetite for more training to improve digital confidence is very welcome. And more importantly, it's achievable. So um, so there's plenty of free resources available. I can see you know, some, some links being shared in the chat. Essentially, the one we were referencing to earlier is the Good Things Foundation. They have so the National Digital Inclusion Network, um, which helps with basic digital skills through the Learn My Way platform. And they have loads of uh, local support group. Uh, they recently did, I think it's just ended yesterday, the Get Online Week, um, which was, a, you know, basically last week was a week where, you know, they invited everybody to get online or to understand better how to, how to use and how to be part of the online world um, and they have a network of several thousands of charities that are looking for more charities to join their network so we'll put the link into the chat and uh, and you can all check it out and, and hopefully find out more about what they do. Uh, there's also the brilliant ability nets that aim to create a digital world that's accessible to all. Uh, they offer a number of services that support a wide range of users. Um, they have tech volunteers uh, that are ready and willing to provide IT support to all the people and disabled people of age of any age anywhere in the UK. Uh, the NCVO they publish tons of helpful support and guidance, news and insight, um, you know, about digital and digital skills. Um, you can also reach out to Digital Candles um, because basically as a charity, you can ask a question via the online form and Digital Candle will match you with an appropriate digital expert, make an intro, and then you receive 60 minutes of free consultancy from a digital expert. Um, we also work with uh, the guys at Charity Excellence Framework who have quite a lot of webinars and a lot of resources um, around, you know, using the basic of ChatGPT, for instance, or finding um, grants online, etc. And then, of course, there's us. Uh, we run, you know, free events, free webinars like this one, and then loads uh, of uh, how to guides and articles that Johan and his team are putting together every day uh, and that free of charge to to access. Um, we recently ran the Digital Inclusion Summit uh, back in June, I think it was, and it had loads of free sessions that we that are now available to watch on our website. Um, so we publish all the links. To, to to that anyway. Um, as some of you may have noticed, we've um, we've also got we're also using on the right hand side of uh, our screen the accessibility toolbar. We working with the guys at Recite uh, Recite Me um, who can also provide some helpful training on making the website um, accessible. So we can chat more a little bit about that. Um, so train is the first way. Second way is strategize your digital output. So digital strategy, 
Um, it's a core part of tackling digital inclusion um, and something too few charities are prioritizing. Um, 37% of our respondents said uh, in our report they did not have a digital strategy. And, um, you know, it allows charities to identify key areas where digital can help them achieve their goals. Um, you know, a digital strategy include information on how you plan to deliver your services digitally and how you can help your service users access those services. Um, it helps, so digital strategy helps organization adopt tech that is really useful, purposeful, um, and um, the, you know, the basic where you need to start is uh, carrying out digital skills and accessibility audit um, when you put together your digital strategy. So you can identify gaps and include plans on how to address them, you know, review, um, you know, your website, for instance, and see whether there might be any gaps in accessibility. Um, and, and more importantly, um, as part of this digital strategy, it's also important to hear from your users and your beneficiaries. Um, we, we can expand a little bit more on that. But um, as we insisted on the um, importance of designing something that is useful for your users' needs, um, for your users, sorry, for your service users, the best, the best um, is to include them in the conversation as early as possible. Uh, we are working on a digital strategy accelerator, and that will provide uh, information, guides, and perhaps mentorship uh, and consultancy to charities that apply to get, you know, to move forward with the digital strategies. Obviously, it's a free of charge uh, program. It lasts, it will last, you know, for, for a, a several months, and we'll pop the link to more information in the resource tab. And the last way to tackle digital exclusion is to collaborate. Um, it was regularly mentioned uh, as a route to promote digital inclusion. You know, um, digital inclusion is best tackled across industries. So it's best if we are working with libraries, with tech companies, with businesses, obviously other charities, uh, funders, the public sector to remove barriers to accessing the online world. Um, and when asked where they can find help when confronted with digital exclusion, um, many charities have pointed to work of their peers in the sector, uh, like their own IT professionals to network like the Digital Poverty Alliance, some libraries, some local government initiatives. Um, so since we launched our campaign in January this year, we found a very open and receptive sector, um, one that is willing to make changes and forge a more inclusive path in the future, which is really, really, um, really great to see. So yeah, we've collaborated with Digital Poverty Alliance, AbilityNet, uh, ReCiteMe, uh, which I was talking about uh, earlier today, um, with uh, PIR as well, which is Public Interest Registry, and they have loads of free contents on how to make the best of you know, your online presence and, and how you can be more visible and inclusive. Um, and we provide links to all of them below so, so you can check them out. And uh, and yes, and then we can share a little bit about uh, digital inclusion charities we love. Back to you, Johan. Yeah, we just, on, on the, the spirit of collaboration, I think we just wanted to end by shouting out some people that have done great things. Um, so these are some of the charities uh, that we, we love and, and we're just going to, yeah, just talk about them a little bit. So start with the Good Things Foundation. They're a brilliant organization. I think a few people in the chat have mentioned them already. Their national data bank provides free data in partnership with Virgin Media O2, Vodafone and Free. Uh, the data bank is organized through local community organizations in the charities network who make individual assessments and provide people with data voucher codes. Good Things Foundation also have a national de device bank, which I think someone did mention. Um, organizations can donate laptops, desktops and smartphones, which are then refurbished and given to people most in need of a working device. It's a really simple and brilliant way to boost digital inclusion. Uh, in a similar vein, the Digital Poverty Alliance are a fantastic organization working really hard to tackle digital poverty. Their global community hub is a place for discussion and collaboration, a place where partners, champions and people from across the sector can learn from each other, share best practice advice and just co-create digital inclusion solutions 
to help charities and their service users. Um, we made a pledge with them recently. Um, we'll share that in the resource. We're apparently going to share a lot in the resources, but, um, <laughs> but uh, we will share it all. And the, the pledge, we encourage other people to take it because we took it and they helped us on that journey and made it really seamless and enjoyable. So we learned a lot by doing that. Lisa? <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we've also learned a lot from our friends at AbilityNet. Uh, they have designed loads of great services that help charities connect online with service users who have disabilities. So they have advice and information that can help your charity uh, become uh, a disability inclusive workplace and obviously be also fully uh, mindful and inclusive of um, uh, service users with disabilities. Um, there's also the charity Scope, uh, uh, who transform attitudes towards disability to tackle injustice and inspire action. And also them are providing uh, resources to help your organization to embed accessibility in you know processes, culture, um, and it's, the most important and what they are doing really well, they allow organization to ensure that, you know, your content writers, the, the, the website designers um, or, you know, the website developers or the platform developers for whatever you are providing to your service users, making sure that they have the correct training understanding and attitude toward inclusive design. Um, and again, it can be very simple um, and and uh, doesn't need to be to be too expensive and, and they can provide loads of great advice on how to get started. Yeah, and two more, perhaps more familiar uh, charities in, in the broader sense, um, sense and RNIB, uh, they both do incredible work improving accessibility of operating systems. Uh, they provide a wealth of resources and a range of support to help charities improve mobile and computer accessibility. Uh, we found them really opening and welcoming charities. So our advice to everyone else is if, if you have any issues around accessibility and you're struggling to find answers online or, or in other places, just get in touch with them directly and I'm sure they'll be happy to help. So just go straight to, to them and, and I'm sure they'll provide you some, some access or at least point you in the right direction. Yeah, they had a really, really good session on social media at the Digital Inclusion Summit. Um, and they were really, really great at explaining how to make your social media activity and campaigns and marketing inclusive and accessible to everyone. Um, so yeah, we highly, highly recommend them. Um, and then we also uh, have been working, hearing from our friends at Age UK. Uh, they provide vital information and advice to allow people to participate meaningfully online. Uh, they have great resources like uh, online essentials, keeping in touch online, managing money online, loads more. Uh, the content is really user-friendly um, and concise, and then they allow users to get the support they need quickly and efficiently. Um, and last but not least, uh, we've got Glitch, which is an award-winning charity that we mentioned earlier, um, and they work to end online abuse and champion digital citizenship. Um, there's this also a specific focus on Black women and marginalized people. Uh, they provide brilliant free resources, so, such as the Fix the Glitch 3.0 toolkit, um, and that's created to help people combat um, digital uh, you know, racism racism and discriminations um and and obviously there's there's plenty more uh, aren't there Johan? yeah uh just to mention here as you can see in this slightly more uh vibrant slide yeah mm -hmm. this uh all the charities we compiled um of the just actually to be honest they're just some of the charities working hard to tackle digital inclusion um sorry to promote digital inclusion and so yeah check them out and obviously we'll send these slides around uh, we'd, we'd like to say personally a massive thank you to all of them for teaching us, for mm -hmm. helping others and for making the online world a more inviting, welcoming and inclusive place. So, yeah, we'll put as many as we can in the resources tab below. And a lot of them are embedded in articles like the um, all you need to know about digital inclusion will have that. And the data, uh, the resource bank will have access to all of these charities, what they're doing and specifically what they're doing to tackle digital, uh, to tackle digital exclusion, promote digital inclusion. That is all we have time for in the presentation. We're 39 past, which is good for a 40 minute presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and now uh, we'll turn to some questions. So please do leave your questions in the Q&A 
Um, and I can see loads of people in the chat. So thank you for sharing all those additional resources. Um, yeah. I agree with so much of what people are sending as well. Uh, Lisa? Yeah, of course. Um, and to to just reflect to, to um to somebody asking the resources tab. So once we post the recording um on our website, uh on the on the different tab on our website, you will have a list of all the resources. Um, don't worry, there's some of them already in the chat. You'll find some of them in the email uh, following this presentation, and then everything would be on our website. Um, but um, let's get started with some questions. We've already got quite a few. Um, and the first one is uh, from Digital Unite. How can funders be persuaded to make digital inclusion one of their priorities? That's a really interesting one. Um, you want, I don't know if you want to share yeah, your I mean thoughts? It's hard to persuade funders to do. They they often we're we're finding. I'm sure other people have experienced it as well. Mm. But funders right now are in that position where, well, firstly, I'm not seeing quite very free funding. We are seeing limited funding available, and it's often quite restricted, um, which is frustrating, particularly in terms of digital in, in, uh, inclusion. Uh, but what I think you can do is is the the best way as ever is to make the case within your proposals. Uh, so just try your best to argue why this is so important. Again, as mentioned at the very beginning, the reason we wanted to pursue this campaign is we think it is massively neglected. Mm. We think it's um, underappreciated. And one of those things that people are so so easily seem to put to the side because it's it's maybe not noted. We see a lot about someone in the chat mentioned uh, inclusive language. We see I see a lot about that, which is mm. great. And I'm really happy about it, particularly from a content perspective but less about accessibility of design because I think it's harder to tackle in some ways. So people tend to, to put it to one side. I think making the case to the funder is, is the most, is, is basically what you can do. Um, drawing attention to the fact that it is underappreciated, that, that it is neglected as a whole uh, throughout the sector, or at least we, we feel like it's neglected. And so just making that case to the funder directly, um, back it up with evidence, substantiate your points, um, that's always important and 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 do your research on, on it. Um, there's plenty of evidence to show. Uh, I, I mean, we've gone through quite a lot of reports and gone through quite a lot of statistics to demonstrate that it's clearly, clearly a, a massive issue. Um, so bringing that to them is 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 the best way. Lisa, anything yeah. on top of that? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, the Good Things Foundation uh, has got a, a few good reports about the, you know, the size and the impact of digital exclusion in the UK. Um, and also bringing it back to one of the comments from our one of our respondents who was saying that um, they were um, adding, you know, some sort of the cost of uh, the providing device and the training to the service users as part of the grant uh, funding proposals. Um, and I think that there is probably um an angle here to to say you know you know i'm asking you know for x amount of pounds in order to better deliver my services um but the reason why i'm asking a little bit for more is that i could reach you know perhaps twice as you know as many people thanks to a little bit more of, of digital training provided to my users whether that's you know going to to see them directly having some volunteers you know um helping them access the the skills hub etc so um so perhaps if if it's possible um within the the sort of grant funding proposal to highlight the the impact in numbers you know reached when digital inclusion is really being taken into account mm. and 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 funded for that that could perhaps uh, make funders say oh okay you know we can mm. reach way more people if we are um really making sure that everybody is included so perhaps those are some of our ideas but we yeah. will definitely look you know yeah more. i would add also centering service users so i think it's always great mm. to have the, the the statistics and the evidence you need that it's 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 necessary to to get uh, funding well often necessary to get funding mm. and you make the case you make powerful digital unite thanks for putting in the chat as well the yes. uh, reiterating lisa's point and showing this resources which i will check out after this but again if you can get some user this is why we mentioned user research at the beginning and that's why it's so vital to actually if you can seek out some some, some of your service users to substantiate the case as well it kind of allows a qualitative and a quantitative uh, approach and i think they work well with each other yes we can show you the statistics it's a almost logical kind of here is why this is an issue you we can show you in real terms in real numbers you balance that with 
responses and qualitative responses from your service users saying if you did this we would feel better or you know it would it would have this impact i think that double pronged approach is always helpful as well yeah definitely no, absolutely um moving on to another question from donna what are the must do's when it comes to inclusivity when designing a website and or social media posts website well um if I may, Lisa, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I would say, well, it depends. Firstly, if you don't, if you, I, I, I'm going to presume this is, I, there's two, two approaches, obviously one, whether you have a website or not, we mentioned auditing earlier. I think a website audit is a really, that was the first step we took because we had a website. I will come to one if you don't have a website. Uh, but yeah, if you do have a website, which I'm sure a lot of people on this call, uh, this call, this webinar will have, I would say, yes, yeah, start with your audit and work out where your issues lie. Uh, because if, you know, that's where you can then see where you can approach it. There is something to say that everyone doesn't have infinite resources, big teams and labor and, and money to spend. So the audit can be done relatively cheap and then it gives you a sense of what is achievable. You know, this isn't a com you can't com complete everything and we have to accept that and be generous with each other in the sense of being aware of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, finding out what you can tackle first in terms of web design is, and, and in terms of what you're doing wrong, really, or what, what's not quite there needs needs to be the first steps and then you'll find as we found there's some really simple steps you can take um and often cost effective steps you can take so that's really good in terms of actually starting if you are starting then i would go down to research with the people you're starting with probably you know so you have loads of different platforms you can use to design a website and you can do it bespoke or you can use you know wordpress on or, or wix yes, or, or yes. what's the other ones i can't can't remember off the top of my head but yeah if you do go with those and your 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 goal is inclusivity and, and and great access then i would probably do your research to find out which one of them provides the best the best access and the best inclusivity options because they will have differences and some of the best places to look is online and see what people think about those websites that's all really available um, and you can also there's other other uh, tools that might prove helpful. And this is a, maybe not answering the question directly, but just just I think might be helpful for other people on the webinar. We there is uh, models you can put your website through that, that gives you an immediate like score of accessibility. We had a similar thing with um, climate change. Uh, you could have, you know, do an emissions thing for your websites, which is also we'd suggest people doing. So these sorts of things, you know, we're we're not a massive charity We're we're sort of less than 20 people at the minute. And we we did these relatively cost effectively. And so I think those small steps and then working out where to go, finding out what you can achieve in, in the short term is probably probably the best place to start, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, obviously, starting small, and uh, you know, in bite size, bite size ideas, um, and uh, uh, two things that I'd like to add is if you are um regularly, you know, in touch with your service users and, you know, other perhaps your donors, um, you could also, you know, have perhaps a dedicated section on the page that says, you know, we are currently um looking at making um our you know website or you know our charity more more accessible more inclusive um please feel free to share um you know some suggestions and perhaps you could have a, a very simple form um and that could also you know once you've done your first audit yourself that could also help you um or you know understand perhaps where to focus first if you have loads of similar feedback um in one specific area and um, when it comes Comes to social media post again i will um uh highly recommend the um rnib session on the social media um inclusivity one thing i particularly re remember because we know this is something that you know many of us use is the use of emojis in social mm. media post um if you want to make your um your social media post accessible, uh, especially with people who have uh, text readers, um, using loads of emojis in your in your in your post can be uh, a bit of a uh, not a nightmare, but it can be quite complex for for people with with you know with text reader um, uh, technology to to access your post. Um, so it you know it's one one thing that really stuck with me because you know we we, we didn't realize really uh, up until uh, that 
that uh, lovely speaker from where Aaron Ibe uh, mentioned it. But um, yes, there are a few, again, a few things, very simple changes to, to make, to make, um, you know, to make what, you know, your output more accessible, uh, more inclusive, and obviously we put more in the chat. Um, so yeah, moving on to the to the following question: Was the yeah again was the best way to be inclusive with no budget? Um, Johan, I don't. Well, um, yeah, I mean the the thing that came to mind is with in kind of leading on from the next question. If you're talking on in in the context of websites, social social media, mm. one thing I think generally is good for everyone is simplicity, um, and I mean that. I, I think inclusive language, for example, is the is always the language I prefer anyway. I, I think it's it's the most accessible language. It's the language that that speaks to the most people in the simplest possible way. And the same thing's true of web design in a way. One one thing that's often exclusive or, ex, or excludes is is just by making complex websites that that don't really lend a good user experience for anyone. Um, one thing is that we've noticed is that if, if you have simple design and you have simple language and you have these things that, that are encouraged in, in the in the broad context of accessibility or inclusivity, they're good for everyone. So so that it's a, it's a net benefit, really. Um, in terms of other ways, I mean, the, the question is quite open how to be inclusive with no budget. I, I would say the first thing, and this is why I've loved some of the charities and I kept mentioning how they they basically were so welcoming and so receptive to us when we started this campaign. We didn't have to do much. We 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 sort of just approached them and said like, and they were they were immediately receptive to supporting us. So I think with no budget, being there for your service users, if if that's the context we're talking about, I think is is the the most important step. So giving them some way of contacting you. Now, of course, that might not be email. Certainly, might not be chatbot. And one of the best ways you probably can do this because of the problems, you know, the, the, the cyclical problem of digital exclusion, you know, people can't train themselves. I think someone in the chat mentioned this. It's difficult to train someone on a device if people don't have that device to train themselves on. So for example, if you just have a phone number that people can call and then you can work through it with your users, that is a low budget and probably the best way to, to immediately bridge that divide. Then you can start thinking about ways of getting devices to people or, or you know, seeing the demands or needs. Maybe training can be done offline, believe it or not, <laughs> um, and all these things. Uh, but it is, that is, I think it, it is a crux of an issue that we've seen over and over again. And one that often isn't really talked about as much as we probably should. And maybe we need to commission articles on it. But how to how to get broaden that gap, not broaden that gap, sorry, close that gap, uh, the initial gap when people don't have access to the, the tech that would allow them to be trained and allow them to have digital include to be part of digital inclusion. Mm -hmm. They don't have that. So, yeah, I would say say go back to basics and make sure that you have that simple ability to contact you and have a conversation with you and, and start uh, service users off. Lisa, I don't know if you want to add stuff because that because it's quite a broad question. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, and 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 then also, um, as you know, as we were saying, um, you know, if if you can speak to speak to peers, speak to other charities, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the same geographical area or perhaps that are delivering perhaps similar services to you, um, ask them, you know, how they are doing, and and perhaps they could have also loads of great, uh, you know low budget suggestions uh, uh for you uh to to implement or to explore um but yeah so 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 again it's all about you know bringing it back to basic and and speaking with uh with people in the same boat and you will you will often hear great great suggestions yeah. um and on that yeah i mean sorry to interrupt oh yeah. but yeah like we mentioned digital candle earlier for example mm -hmm. They are one of many organizations that in, yeah. in kind of infrastructure, small, low, low level infrastructure organizations that will will for free just talk you through these on. A, I mean, there's only so much we can do in a QA and a on a web on a webinar mm -hmm. and our advice won't be unique to your needs. So go and approach those organizations mm -hmm. who are free of charge and they will talk yeah. you through and they are experts on on the tech issues that, that mm -hmm. will confront your service users. So they're going to be far more helpful than us. Uh, yeah, we're trying, we're trying our best. We're trying our best. We're, we're no digital candle. <laughs> um, moving on to the next question. So, uh, somebody asking, are there any forums, spaces where we can get together to collaborate on some of these issues? Yeah, I'm sure you know some as well, Lisa, but uh, just to start off, Digital Poverty Alliance Global yeah. Community Hub. 
I mentioned, yep, yeah, it's a place of discussion, collaboration, and we've we've found it useful. And to be honest, a lot of these charities actually do offer that as as a as a key part of it. Uh, but I do find that place a, a, a really nice place to go and have a chat and and find these other charities um, that mm. are, you know, experiencing the same issues or experiencing similar issues. And a lot of the joy of digital poverty alliances, they might. Uh, offer you some and themselves will offer you some advice about how to yeah. tackle individual issues um yeah, yeah. i don't know if you have any other specific yeah the, to... yeah the good things foundation and their network yeah. um that they you know once you join the network you um you you get you know you receive regular communications and uh and yeah it's also a great way to to speak with peers and and charities in a similar similar situation mm. um so yeah we, we'd recommend we'd recommend that um you can also ask questions on a, a website called Charity Connect, um, mm. where you know where other charity professionals can can provide tips and and guidance. Um, that's a bit more generic, but yeah, Digital yeah. Poverty Alliance and Good Things Foundation could be could be great great yeah. starts. And just to add as well is if you have a unique exclusion issue, for example, if if age, mm. finding age a predominant thing there may be approach charities that are related to that age UK would obviously be the obvious one. Mm. Um, but yeah, if, if you, you're finding that, that a lot of your service users are, are older and, and that's the issue you're facing, if it's more affordability or sort of socioeconomic issues, then there's charities that deal with that too. So just, you know, if you can locate, identify the the nature of the digital inclusion exclusion issue, and th there may not be one, as I mentioned, there's not always one and sometimes they're presumed and it's actually a lot of more of a widespread issue than initially presumed but if you can locate a direct issue then maybe reaching out to those individual charities or those charities that deal more specifically with with your your uh, issue would be would be good as well brilliant thank you Yuan. um another question uh, would you say all charity websites should now have accessibility toolbars as long as they can afford to do so my charity has been resistant to the idea stating that the web design meeting um wcag is enough which i thought is disappointing yeah i will for this one i i do know there is opposing opinions so what mm. i would say is we found the tool mm. helpful um people do think that you should actually just have i mean the the, the essence is that charities should or websites should be accessible regardless of the toolbar that's one uh, a, a school of thought if you will um our our perception really and our approach has been that the toolbar we we found recite me toolbar helpful and we think it's been helpful for our service users and we have heard uh, positive things but just because you have a toolbar i think this is the key for me just because you have the accessibility toolbar doesn't mean you should forget accessibility across your site if people aren't using the toolbar or if it's not there then you can still in you still should do things like always use inclusive language, try to have a text for speech option as much as you can, or at least, I mean, one thing we did again with limited resources, because you have to pay for the text for speech. There's places like 11 labs, for example, that we've used and, and other places, and you do get it on the toolbars, but the text for speech options are costly. So we tried to put it on as many of the sort of higher uh, reaching articles or articles that dealt specifically mm -hmm. with uh, digital inclusion and exclusion and so on and so forth. So it's always about trying to find a balance. But the one thing I would say overwhelmingly is that you should, with with or without a toolbar, you should, should focus on making your website accessible anyway. Um, and I think that that's kind of where I land on it. But as I said, I, I have heard other people have have different opinions of of toolbars and we did our research and, and landed in a particular place but go and, and hear both arguments is what i would yeah. say yeah yeah absolutely um and again and um, as uh as as a as I could add is if you um, are able to speak with perhaps some of your service users yeah. or other stakeholders um, and ask them a very simple questions, you know, do you, do you think our website could be more, more accessible? And if so, you know, what, what would you suggest? Um, that could also be, um, mm. you know, helpful for you to, to sort of build a case and to, uh, you know, to go beyond the WCAG um, sort of rules. Um, mm. So yeah, um, you know, if, if you're able, to have uh you know again some data from your stakeholders to to sort of back back up your wish for for more uh for more accessibility then it's, it's always good um yeah. and uh, and yeah and then um i'll end with with the last questions um any advice on adding images or describing images for accessibility um there might be some 
an answer around alt text perhaps that we yeah can, you know? i would say alt text is definitely the, the place to start and yeah. i mean we have an article on I'll, I'll, if i remember or if our producer remembers uh we'll add that to their resources as well it's it's just there's simple ways of doing alt text that are really effective so for example the common mistake is people say this is an image of which is all a bit redundant um but so like for example if it's an image of you know a zoom logo you just write a zoom logo you don't write this is an image of a zoom logo there's loads of other advice about being you know really clear using concise language which honestly applies to alt text but should apply for your writing across your website as well um and 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 finding uh you know images we, we try and have a consistency of style within our images for various reasons but that along with an image policy i guess brings us to one final point and we're at the end of time i'm aware of that but at the same time one final point is that creating a policy around accessibility in every realm of, of your content or or your website is, is a really important thing to do. So, for example, we embed it within our house style so that everything we write, every image we source, everything we upload has this sort of has to go through the policy and make sure that we're doing taking these steps to make sure that our content is accessible. So creating a policy around images, creating a policy around content, around videos, and making sure you're always mindful of accessibility, mindful of inclusion is probably the, the big, biggest step you can take towards that goal from a content perspective, um, a content and comms perspective. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Johan. And uh, yeah, that's all we've got you. time for today. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us. We hope you found it uh, yeah, insightful and, and you had a, a few uh, a takeaways from it. Um, we will share some link, uh, obviously, in resources uh, in, uh, in the chat and by email. Um, and there's also uh, some feedback we'd love uh, for you to, to give us in order to, to continue to provide um, some great and relevant webinars. So thank you very much to all of you have a great rest of the the afternoon and the week and hope to see you again soon thanks you. cheers lisa